This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. Get access to my streaming video service Nebula when you sign up for CuriosityStream using the link in the description. Formula One has got a little tricky in recent years slash decades in terms of overtaking opportunities and side-by-side -side action. While I remain adamant that the blame for this lies primarily in the hands of the cars, which are massively long, throw out horrible wakes of dirty, dirty, dirty air, and have vanishingly small braking distances, it's very obvious that the thrill factor promised is delivered more at some circuits than others. And finally, we're seeing tracks start to change their layout and geography slightly to accommodate modern F1. You know, just before we finally change the actual cars in the name of racing. Cool. Cool. Zandvoort, for example, is returning to host the new Dutch Grand Prix this year, but decided to do some pretty hefty modifications to heavily bank and improve some of the corners to open up some racing opportunities and to add some unique and exciting flavour to the circuit. It still looks like close racing might be a struggle, but it seems like we're going to have a lot more fun having a crack at it, at least. In Russia, meanwhile, well, Sochi had no real excuse, did it, being delivered in 2014, but we are finally moving to a new location, another fancy new track, Igora Drive in St. Petersburg. And despite being launched in only 2019, even that is getting a significant extension at its final sector to give Formula 1 cars a fast, rollercoastery loop with significant rise and fall through the long, triple left-hander. Will it be awesome? I guess we'll see in a couple of years. But this video focuses on two venues with firm feet in the F1 calendar, Australia's Albert Park and Abu Dhabi's Yas Marina. See, now, I've always enjoyed racing out in Albert Park and was quite surprised to find a lot of people calling it a bit dull. I guess I get carried a lot by the first race of the season vibes and the super local atmosphere Melbourne always brings. It is a show. And there's always a bit of chaos and unpredictability as the brand new cars go racing for the first time out on this dusty park track. But yes, overtaking is a bit tricky out there. Increasingly so over the years. Damn you, long cars! Let's start slightly off track. Albert Park has quite a narrow pit lane with the knock-on effect being a low speed limit through the pits, just 60 kilometers an hour. This is now widened by a couple of meters and with that comes a 20 kilometer an hour rise in that speed limit. So cars pitting can now travel at 80 kilometers an hour, which in turn means a smaller penalty for changing tires and potentially opens up options for strategy across the race. Taking a second stop won't be as big a risk now. On track, Albert Park is widening certain corners. Two and a half meters inside turn one, four meters inside turn three, seven and a half meters inside turn six, and three and a half meters at turn 15. Now the changes at turn one and three are aimed squarely at giving more opportunity for overtakes by increasing the racing line options available through the corner and limiting defensive moves. The widening of turn one now gives cars the option of taking various positions into and through the corner and more readily allowing battles to continue through turn two and up to turn three instead of narrowly shuffling the cars into single file. Turn three has also been cambered inwards to reduce understeer and allow cars to hold their line through this corner. Now the widening of turn six is dramatic. It used to be a janky little corner, too tight and fiddly to be an overtaking spot. It was just a little bit of an awkward flick flack. Adding a full seven and a half meters on the inside of six increases the expected speeds by a massive 70 kilometers an hour and will make it part of a new high speed section that runs right through to turn 11. Previously, turn six would kind of separate the cars a bit as they braked and squirted their way through navigating this part of the track before the run to the 910 chicane. But the organizers believe with the changes here, the cars can stay in hot pursuit out of turn four, stay tight through turn six, seven and eight before getting to turn nine. So let's talk about turn nine and 10. On paper, this looks like it might have been an overtaking spot, a hard braking zone into a chicane, but it never was. So the chicane is now gone. Instead, it's been elongated into a fast S, continuing this quick run from turn four right down Lakeside Drive. There's even talk of another DRS zone being added here, though it would be mighty frightening if they did it. And this will remain subject to approval by the FIA. So this whole section is gonna be a ride. Maybe a bit more of that Baku final sector feel with the zipping close to the barriers, building up speed right to what's already a fast, tricky chicane in sixth and seventh gear through 11 and 12. Now this is already very much a brave it out and hang on for dear life kind of corner as it is, and they'll be coming at it even faster now. We then get to turn 13 where they've given it a completely new profile. 
the entry straight is extended slightly and the whole corner angle tightened with the track widened on the inside. Once again, they are adding camber here to change it from a tricky understeery corner into one where you can really stick it in and have a go. With the harder braking zone, a bit more space and more grip from the camber, there's a real potential here for a driver to stick their car alongside, though it will remain tricky to pull a move off, I suspect. Turn 15, the penultimate corner, is also widened on entry to give attacking cars more scope to get alongside and not get boxed out by the defending driver. This will give them opportunity to perhaps continue the fight through the final corner and stay closer up to the pick straight and have a crack into turn 1. This also will be cambered in a bit. Overall, we're looking at a 5 second drop in lap times, a 15 km an hour increase in average speed and a 28 meter shortening along the racing line. It's also likely turns 9 and 10 will lose their status as corners, so the track will become a 14 turn circuit, down from 16. Unlike with Zandvoort, it remains to be seen how these changes might improve the actual racing, but it looks like a much more dramatic ride and a real challenge for the drivers. We were originally to see this new layout in November before the 2021 Australian Grand Prix was cancelled completely, so we will see the new cars on the new track next year instead. But there was talk of permanently moving the race to this later slot, which could also change the very nature of the track by placing it in local summer rather than autumn. And so we head to Yas Marina in Abu Dhabi, which almost certainly will go ahead this year. It seems now to be permanently anchored as the host of the grand finale of the F1 season, and honestly, what a damp squib to end on. It has been a complete nightmare for racing since it first showed up in 2009 and really proved its roadblock to overtaking the very next year when Alonso in a far superior Ferrari got stuck behind lowly Vitaly Petrov in a lowly Renault for the entire back half of the race resulting in him losing an almost certain championship. Not good. In 2016, Hamilton tried to salvage a championship by driving incredibly slowly and holding up a whole train of cars behind him in the hope that one of them would overtake Rosberg. There was no overtaking. It is incredible how the most modern, most expensive Grand Prix track, a circuit that could have been custom designed to do and be anything, was so utterly pantaloonly rubbish. The opening sector has a quite narrow medium speed corner followed by a fast sweeping section which is actually pretty fun. But it then runs headlong into a clunky chicane which immediately feeds into a hairpin. Waste of a good hairpin if you ask me. There's no space or time here to get alongside and try anything. The reduced speeds into the hairpin allow the grandstands a close seat to the action thanks to less need for long runoffs, but what are they going to look at? A shambles, that's what. So now they've got rid of this silly chicane. Gone. We now directly connect this run of track to the first back straight with a more open hairpin. So now there's a flat out run from turn one to the hairpin, which becomes a 300 km an hour braking event out of the fast flickety flickety flack of turns three and four. The fast complex will be tricky for cars to stay close, but there will be fun opportunities on the brake pedal here that, even if they don't result in an overtake, will allow the battle to continue down the double back straights. These two DRS zones always provided the biggest overtaking potential on the track. The first into the mid chicane here, and then at the end of the second straight into the left, right, left, and left again of turns 11 to 14, where cars could occasionally rough and tumble it out through this entire sequence. Now this was quite rare though, as it's a narrow, awkward bit of track, and we're more likely to see a car bailing out across the runoff than sticking it out side by side. But this was a potential action point, so it is interesting to see them completely remodel the whole area. But there is good reason for this. Instead, we'll have this long, open, banked hairpin that changes this part of the track from slow, pokey, fiddly nonsense into something fast and dramatic. Cars running side by side down the back straight could continue to brave it out right through this corner, potentially, or alternate lines through the sweep to set themselves up to be ready for the attack at the exit. This, plus the faster Sector 1, could suddenly start putting real work into the tyres in ways they haven't really experienced here before, changing the very nature of the lap. But the effects don't stop there. Turn 14 used to lead into the rather thrilling, from a driving point of view, run through 15, 16 and 17. These are fast corners that increasingly tighten as you blast through the sequence, giving you very little time to get the car square for the heavy braking into 17. It's great fun to drive and now they're heading even faster thanks to the new trajectory into the old turn 15, which is now turn 10. So that braking zone into 17 is going to be even trickier. 
We then head into the final part of the lap where the last set of changes are being made. So this part of the track is rubbish. Always has been. And it's partly because they don't have any space for anything different. Sure, they didn't have to put a honking big hotel in the middle of the track, but they've made their bed, put a chocolate on the pillow, so I guess we all have to lie in it. But to be fair, they are also hemmed in by the actual marina and the rest of the track, so it's, you know, tricky. It ended up very street tracky. Stop right, stop left, stop left, and so on. Right back to the teensiest little pitch straight. The drivers spend the whole sequence just waiting to go racing again. It's not very Formula 1 at all. So what they have managed to do now is round off all these corners with wider radii to make the whole section more flowing and slightly faster so the cars can actually have a proper run through. Potentially it will even improve racing as they won't be constantly braking and accelerating and concertinering so they can build momentum right through the end of the lap somewhat. So what they're doing here overall is changing the nature of the whole track. They've tried to get rid of most of the point and squirt fiddliness and turn the whole place into a fast flowing ribbon of racetrack. Some of it's subtle, but it could change the whole feel of the place. And I'm very interested in what Pirelli choose to bring. It might not be the softest range this time. The proof of the pudding is under the crust, of course, but it looks like we'll be getting a more interesting watch at the very least. So let's cross our fingers that we get some good racing out of it too. And look, we can't be sure that the changes made in Australia and Abu Dhabi at Zandvoort and Igora Drive will make for markedly better racing. But I am glad they're finally doing something to circuits based on actual thoughtful planning. Plus, with the heavily reinvented machines of 2022 coming, maybe we are at a turning point for racing action. Although, what is this? Honestly. Hey, remember how at the top I said this video was sponsored by CuriosityStream and alluded to Nebula? Well, you may know CuriosityStream as a subscription streaming service with thousands of superb documentaries and fascinating informative works like this piece on future energy tech. You know how I love my energy stuff? And this one's narrated by Sigourney Weaver. Now, while CuriosityStream is the big budget, all guns blazing, mega production hub, they also love us independent education-ish creators too. So they've teamed up with Nebula, a streaming platform built by creators to give themselves room to stretch their legs outside of YouTube. There's lots and lots of wonderful creators making videos on music, film, oh look, it's me, science, engineering, art, People you may already know and love, like Real Engineering, Cinema Wins, and Jill Bearup, who fights in a wedding dress at one point, amazingly. And since you're on my channel, you probably like explainer videos, and oh ho ho, there's no shortage here, and they're all completely ad-free. And there's even stuff you won't see on YouTube at all, like entire original series and bonus content. Like, if you're watching this video on Nebula, I'm ranting about that Jeddah racetrack right now instead of talking about CuriosityStream and Nebula's riches. So, here's the cool bit. If you sign up to CuriosityStream, you get Nebula for free. Free for as long as you're a CuriosityStream subscriber. Isn't that simple and cool? And if you sign up via my link in the description, curiositystream.com slash chainbear, you'll get 26% off the annual plans. That's just $14.79 for the whole entire year for both streaming services. By signing up, you're not only giving yourself a huge wealth of content on both platforms, but you're helping me and all of us smaller independent educational type creators. And you'd be very cool 